I, I have a lot to share with you, but it's not a scripted talk. And I am very happy to be interrupted by you pushing back as to how does this fit the context where you are. So I am on a passionate mission around excellence with kids. Um, how that fits your setting, whether you are a, a faculty member here or a school leader or a teacher or uh, wherever your current position here as an educator is, it's fine to raise your hand and say, here's my setting, I don't see how that fits for me, or make the bridge for me, and I'll do my best to do so. I, I just had a really uh, great discussion with Tali, who's on staff here uh, during lunch, around this issue of sort of to what degree are students in Jewish schools, whether they're uh, an Orthodox <coughs> school or a form or a liberal school, to what degree is the Jewish cultural learning dovetailing and integrating with the academic learning, and to what degree are those two seen as separate by faculty or by kids? <coughs> and to me, that's a fascinating topic. <coughs> Bless you. I, I just came back from a week of working with Hawaiian immersion charter schools. Uh, these are schools that on the, the big island of Hawaii and the other islands of Hawaii are trying to bring back the Hawaiian language and culture. And the parallels for me were instant for me in talking with Tali about Jewish culture, because here's the issue. The young people are all forgetting and letting go of the language and of the culture. And the, the elders of the Hawaiian community are totally freaked out that they'll lose that culture. So, the, so they have started this uh, new network of Hawaiian immersion charter schools where the Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian language is part of what they teach. It, so these schools are bilingual, bicultural schools. And the problem is, how do you teach all that language and culture and still have enough time to have kids academically prepared to compete with kids in the <coughs> secular schools? And I imagine that resonates with many of you. Um, so my work with them f over the course of a week, which was humbling work since I know no Hawaiian and knew no Hawaiian culture, I had to come in as a very humble person of all I could share was that a lot of my work is how to build projects that unify those two where the projects themselves are engaging and deepening kids in their cultural roots, and yet there are academic projects to the core. So for example, what I was trying to support them to do is to go out, for example, and get the stories of the elders in the Hawaiian community and create books and videos honoring their culture. They have to have the language to do that. They have to celebrate it. But the books themselves and the videos they're creating themselves are going to take a whole lot of the core literacy practices and work that they have to study. So there isn't that choice, are we now teaching culture, are we now teaching academics, but the culture and academics are in, intertwined at all points in their instruction. So that was my work with them. It was really challenging and exciting work, and it was a great new culture for me to learn about. I actually have a few products from that, those schools here on the tables that I just brought back with me. But anyway, that's an example of bridges that we can try to make. If you have questions about how these things fit your setting, please push on those. Um, I would like to share mostly today visual images for you because I've, some of you have read my book and I've already had a lot of words out there. And I think in some ways I'm a concrete and visual person and I would love for you to leave with images in your mind. So I brought a few hundred pieces of student work, and then I brought slides of my life and my setting and video of the students that I work with. So I hope you can leave sort of with the models in mind rather than just words. The work that I brought here that we'll use in the second half of the setting is not primarily from my classroom. It's from schools all over the country, K through 12 schools that I work with as part of the Expeditionary Learning Project Network. But this first hour, I want to tell you my last 30 years. The story that I told in that book, I'd like you to have the visual images to go with that. Um, for those of you who did not read the book, I live in a small town. I live in a town that has no stores and has no traffic lights, and the roads are dirt. There are some paved roads, but I don't live on one of them. Mm -hmm. And I taught every single kid born in this town for 30 years. So anyone in this town under the age of 43 was a student of mine. <laughs> at some point. So it's a real small town world. Um, every, when I one day drove my truck down to the base of my driveway and got hit by a speeding Camaro, um, I jumped out of my truck and the Camaro was upside down and I pulled out the driver who was fine and he said, Mr. Berger, what are you doing here? 
And then when the police, which are, there's no full-time police in my community, but when the police showed up, of course, it was a former student. When the ambulance showed up, who was not needed, it was a former student. When the tow truck showed up, it was a former student. <laughs> so we were all standing there at the base of my driveway just talking about life, you know, in town. That's the world that I lived in and I still live in because I still live in my small house in town and my driveway <coughs> is plowed by a former student. And when I have plumbing problems, I call my former student come, to come help me with them. Um, but my life is really different right now in my professional life. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I helped to found an, a network of project-based schools where character is infused with academics. And I work with those schools now across the country, primarily in New England, but also in other places in the country as well. So the archive of student work I brought is actually national archive of kindergarten through high school kids work. A big difference for me is that I tend now to work with suburban and urban schools, not as many rural schools there are, and as many small town schools like me. So I work a lot now with high school kids, kids of color, kids in inner cities, uh, and trying to do the very same quality work there as we were doing in our small setting and collect models of that. So my main framing for this is that I don't think there is any quick fix toward excellence. There's no quick path. There's no magic bullet. That this is all cultural. And that by building a culture in our schools where kids feel pressured to do good work and be good people, we succeed. And I do mean pressured. I really do believe in positive peer pressure. I believe that the peer community of kids sets the tone of how to be. And when a kid comes into your schools, for those of you who are school-based, and the feeling in that school is, in this school you've got to work hard and you have to treat people well, they will shape up. And all the things we do as adults to plead kids and beg kids to do that won't work if the message they're getting from peers is, you don't really have to care about that. Or in this school, don't try to look smart. So for me, it was kind of easy to be in a community that was so isolated that we could start that at preschool. And by the time I got kids, they did quality work. I hardly had to do any new reframing. Now I'm working with inner city high schools where the kids are afraid to raise their hand because it's not cool to look smart. And so the very first thing we have to do is to change the entire vibe of what school is about. That in this school, it's cool to be smart and to treat other kids well. And I think that it's that holistic model for all of you, I think building on the culture of Jewish values is the key to undergirding what that is about. And as Tally and I were talking about, making that relevant to adolescence is hard. So making it seem like it's not outdated to be part of that long heritage and culture is what I was working with the Hawaiian charter schools to do, to frame their work in terms of those values. So rather than just talk in the abstract, let me tell my story to you with visual images. So if I could have a couple people hitting lights. All right, I'm going to quickly bring you through the world where I live. And you're welcome to get up and stretch at any point during this. So here's my world. I still have snow at my house, just to let you know, when I left. Uh, I live in western Massachusetts. The small town is called Shutesbury. And this is not current. There's not as much snow as that right now. But I do have, <laughs> I do have snow in my yard as of this morning. The town has a church. As I said, there's no stores in town. There's a church. There's a post office, which is also Mary Dillman's home. There's a town hall, which was a two-room schoolhouse up until the school was built when I arrived in the early 70s. Now it's the town hall. There's the Shootspray Athletic Club. There are no elliptical trainers in this building. <laughs> this is a bar. And, uh, <laughs> There is a, a pool table and a jukebox, so it's kind of athletic. <laughs> so the town has a church and a bar and a school, and that's really the town. Um, here's the school. And um, one of the things that makes this school culturally clear from the very beginning is that every older kid in this school is paired with a younger child. So from the moment a preschooler arrives, they have an older kid who's assigned to help them learn to read, but also to help them get their boots on, which where we live is a big <coughs> mess when you have preschoolers, and to ride the bus with them and to take care of them. So we often had, in my fifth and sixth grade classrooms, little three and four-year-olds coming in saying, I need to see my buddy. I'm having a hard day. And my kids would just leave the room instantly without any permission needed 
to help take care of the younger kids. So instead of being afraid of the older kids, the older kids were their protectors. So right away, things were framed in a way of, in this school, you take care of people. Kids worked in this school. And this is a really weird thing if you're not in Japan or an Asian country right now. But kids cleaned the hallways. They shoveled snow. They cleaned up the playground. They cooked. They cleaned up after. Everybody worked in shifts. Um, luckily, it was a small town Yankee culture where parents didn't get mad that their kids were scraping plates. They felt like, geez, they complain about it at home. I'm glad you can get to do them here <laughs> to get work done. But it was part of that ethic of this is our building. We keep it clean. So my obsessive sense of this ethic of excellence is it goes really deep, which is we care for where we live. We care for the people that live here, not just our regular academic skills. Because I lived in an isolated place, we partnered with a lot of schools outside of ours. Um, some of you who have read the book knew that I had a personal interest in other cultures. And we did a, a yearly connection with schools for the deaf, because deaf culture was a culture that really interested me. This is a partnership we have with the Clark School for the Deaf in Northampton, Massachusetts. It's an oral school for the deaf, no signing used. The little girl in the middle, Erin, is wearing an FM system. And she was the partner of Jenny, the girl on the right, for the whole year. Uh, in an oral setting. We also had a partnership with the New York City School for the Deaf in Manhattan, which is an entirely signing school, no voice used. Um, and my students had to learn American Sign Language in order to get along there for three days and stay with their partners. After our days down in New York City, those deaf students came up and stayed at the homes, the trailers, and the farms of my students in the woods. For those New York City deaf students, it was their first time in their lives out of the city. For most of them, it was their first time in their lives ever in a house, since they lived in high rises in Manhattan, and uh, their first time around hearing people. So it was a major cultural exchange. This is a kindergartner's view of her life. I make projects, I like to swim, and I go to sleep. <laughs> uh, the reason I love this triptych is that first piece of I make projects, where you see those big hands and that capable, I can do this. She wouldn't have said, I make worksheets with that kind of pride. <laughs> you know, Projects are really different. Projects are like, I do this stuff, and it's great, and I'm proud of it. And this girl is one of my great success stories. When you live in a town where not many, where the, not many of the parents graduated from high school, it, getting every kid into higher education is a great mission of mine. This girl is a, a graduate student at Princeton after having graduated summa cum laude from Harvard. She's fluent in Hebrew and Arabic and English and Italian. And she's uh, studying political science at Princeton now for a PhD. It's just remarkable, because just yesterday she was making projects in kindergarten. You know, it's <laughs> like. I also have her on videotape. You'll see a moment of her later on videotape. Um, there's a section of the school library which is kid written. So you can check out books written by kids. And they have the little cards in the back. And so there's a public audience for the writing that first graders and second graders do. They know when they write books that they're going to be on display for other children. The projects are sometimes musical, an originally written composition by a first grader. They're three-dimensional. This is a model of the, the valley where my school is based, uh, done to scale from mud dug up from behind the school by third graders. And the kids are involved in original research. They're involved in original scientific research and original ethnographic and historical research. <coughs> so in my state of Massachusetts, they did an amphibian census. They tried to figure out which amphibians lived in which counties and which towns. In most towns and cities, there was a naturalist, a herpetologist, or an Audubon naturalist who went and did the work. We didn't have anyone in our town to do it, so the kids took it on. And all the data they collected were sent to the state. And we actually had a more comprehensive amphibian census than any town in the state, because instead of one person, we had 38 kids going into the swamps and going into the rivers and going into the woods and bogs to see what they could find. And the kids collected larvae, and they collected full-grown animals. And everything they collected, they photographed and researched and measured and wrote up and sent all their data to the state census, along with the other herpetologists from the state. 
one of the amazing things that happened in this amphibian study was that the kids found an amphibian that was not supposed to live in our state. <laughs> and when they wrote to the state herpetologists about it, the state responded via email that it was really nice to hear that, but they were mistaken because this amphibian didn't live in our territory. To which the kids replied, we think we're not mistaken, and here's a digital photo of what we found. And then the state emailed back and said, we'll be out next week. <laughs> and indeed, the kids were right, and the, the four-toed salamander that they had found turned out to be in our area, even though the, the state government didn't realize it at the time. So when the kids did their studies and produced their amphibian field guide, it was something that was more accurate than you could have gotten out of the state, really. <coughs> this is a cover of a field guide done by a third grade boy. And the reason it's beautiful is not just because this boy does a careful job, but because this is his sixth draft of this cover. And his draft went through many critique structures with his classmates to make it a beautiful piece. Um, similar project. Third and fourth grade kids part of the, the International Monarch Watch project, collecting young caterpillars, raising them to be big caterpillars, studying them, watching them emerge from their chrysalids, and getting an entire room full of monarch butterflies out of that. Then once each kid had their butterflies that they were taken care of, they designed and built cages for their butterflies to care for them for a week while they studied them fed them and cared for them as they studied them, and then eventually tagged them as part of the Monarch Watch program. You can see that little tag on that one on Marlena's nose there, and then released them to go to Mexico on their migration for part of the research project. My sixth graders did research over the course of 20 years in a number of ways because we had no public works people that worked for our town. The, the, the government in my town was a volunteer government. so. Uh, there was nobody to monitor things. So the radon levels of people's houses were monitored by my students. The quality of water in the streams was monitored by students. Um, students went out and used high school and college level test kits and figured out if there was pollution in our streams and then presented all those data to the Conservation Commission, the Town Board of Health, and the town meeting. They also did the well study, where they tested everybody's wells in town. In my town, there is no water supply. Everyone has a well. I have a well. Uh, the school has a well. But nobody knew if their water was safe or not. So the kids used a mass spectrometer at the local college, worked along with college students, and found out whether the well water was safe. Each family got an individual well report, and then a well report was created for the town. One of, one of the ulterior motives for me in this study was these are kids whose parents may not have graduated from high school, but I really wanted them to go to college. And the best way I could think of getting them to go to college was to have them work in a college laboratory for a month or two, along with college students. At the end of that, they were all convinced they could go to college. In fact, they were convinced that college was easier than elementary school. <laughs> they would come back and say, those kids sleep until 2. <laughs> then they have one class, and then they go to a party. It's like. <laughs> What's hard about that? <laughs> so the idea that they, had, they didn't even go to class every day, I mean, they just decided college was a breeze. So they all decided college was certainly within their sights. Um, this is my individual well report. We did find issues with wells. In fact, my family found some issues. I now have a well filtration system in my home. Kids said, do you want the bad news now, or do you want to wait for your letter? I said, come out in the hall and give it to me now, please. <laughs> And they created a website to share with the town the general findings. I didn't know how to create a website with these kids, so I had a college student come in and work with the kids, and they were much quicker than I in learning it. Um, there's a section of the book about uh, during our geology work, doing rock and mineral tumbling. So this is a tumbled stone uh, there on the right, and an untumbled same stone, day and night agate, on the left. We tumbled. Uh, thousands of stones during the time we were studying geology, and we had a jewelry center going in the classroom. Kids worked with the professional jewelers to learn how to make jewelry. I invested a, about $1,000 of my own money into this project, into jewelry findings. The kids were doing all the ordering, and I, they were keeping the books, and they knew exactly how in debt we were. 
and every time they placed another order for jewelry findings, we got deeper in debt. And I told them they wouldn't graduate while they were in debt. So they were <laughs> totally freaked out. <laughs> but they kept having to order new things and really figure out how to make this work. Um, when they priced their items, they had to figure out how much profit they wanted and to what degree was this a profit-making venture and to what degree was it a service to the town. And the system they came up with was something you would never see in a commercial uh, world, which was they decided they would give discounts to any kid who was poor. So the first thing they did is they went to the principal and they said, we want the free lunch list so we can give kids discounts. And the principal wouldn't give them a free lunch list, of course, because it's proprietary. And the kids came back and said, we could just make a list of who's poor. We know everybody in town. <laughs> so they started making a list of like who has a color TV, who still has a black and white TV, who has an older car, who, has, who lives in a trailer. And then they realized, boy, this is pretty sensitive too. So they ripped it up. And they said, what do we do? And I said, I don't know. It's your store. What do you guys want to do? This is your decision. And they decided this crazy system where anybody who came up who the kids knew was poor, if they didn't have enough money, they would just ask them to come back and recess and give them a special discount. So if a kindergartner came up and said, I need to buy a necklace, they'd say, how much money do you have? And the kid would say, I don't know. I don't know how to count it. And they'd say, well, let's count your money together. And they count it. And they'd say, OK, you have a dollar and 18 cents. Come back at recess because we have a special sale. And when that kid came back without his friends around, they'd say, the whole top row here is $1.18. So you can buy any piece you want for your mom. And they decided if they lost money on some items, they'd make money on others. And that was OK, because it was a fair way to be. And then they even had a one cent booth, because some of the preschoolers weren't even allowed to bring in money. So they gave them pennies during the day. And they had a one cent booth. Then they brainstormed a, a, a name for their store, and I hated it. And I said, we can't use that. It's a terrible name. And they said, it's not your store. <laughs> so this is what it was. <laughs> and I had no veto power over it, unfortunately. <laughs> and on the first day, they took in over $1,200 of small bills, and they were out of debt and totally delighted. And I drove them down to the bank where they deposited their money. On the second day, they took in $1,000. And they kept going until they sold out absolutely everything they made. This is the one cent booth where they're selling crystals they collected. And then I'm going to bring you through quickly through a sequence of one particular thematic study. And that study is of architecture. It started on the second day of school, cave exploring. On the first day of school, kids showed up in their fanciest clothes, their new sneakers. And everyone checked each other out because they're pre-adolescents and adolescents to see who was cool and who wasn't cool and who looked good and who didn't look good. And immediately, the cliques started to kick in a little bit. Next day of school, it all dissolved because I told them they had to wear their grubbiest clothes and they were going to be scared to death in total darkness underground. <laughs> and soon they were because this is the opening to the first cave we went in. Doesn't look like one of those big commercial caves with lights and tour guides and stuff. This little crack in the ground is followed by a 50-foot drop. So here are the kids coming down the 50-foot drop. Here's a parent spotting them on the way down. This is a local carpenter, actually, who worked with me on the cabinets in my home that I built. And that is daylight there, up 50 feet up, that little trapezoid of green in the middle there. And very soon, these kids were squeezing through underground tunnels. Now, these photos are deceptive because I had a flash, because it was totally dark in there. All you saw was flashlights. So when kids were grabbing each other and helping each other through these squeezes, they had no idea if the kid helping them was a cool kid or not, or a parent or a kid. They were hugging each other and crying and laughing and screaming underground, and they had no idea who they were hugging or whom they were <laughs> talking to. And so all those distances sort of broke in that we're all underground, and our teacher is insane. We're all going to die. And we, <laughs> we're all in this together. And they bonded. Uh, in a way that they had a totally delightful time underground, kids and adults. And by the time they got to the top of the thing, they were all hugging each other, and they were filthy, and they all felt heroic like Indiana Jones. I did this trip for 25 years, never left a kid behind. <laughs> this girl on the left, uh, Carmel, has several palsy. She came to the school in a wheelchair, but by sixth grade, she was walking even without canes. But getting up a mountain and into a cave was going to be tricky. But not a single kid said, what's Carmel going to do when we go caving? They said, how are we getting Carmel up the mountain tomorrow? And we got Carmel up the mountain with a lot of help and a climbing harness so that when she climbed through the caves on her own, we kept a hand on it to make sure that she was safe. 
So the message here was that everybody gets through. Every, there is no exception. You never get left behind in the school. We are one community here. And when we had our celebration with Carmel that day, it was as big a celebration as we've ever had getting through K-1. These are kids that now felt like we're not in the cool kids and uncool kids. We're all heroes here. That was followed by a project where kids did a cross-sectional cave home design as part of learning cross-sectional view. So this is a pretty fancy home, uh, even though it's a cave home. You can see it's got lots of nice sections in it. And I actually have this piece of work here that you can see more close up. Yeah, it's over on it. This is another cave home design. This one is an entire underground kingdom. Uh, the girl, who, I have this one here as well. The girl who created this was a fan of Tolkien. And they were writing a novel that went along with their diagram. So this was the diagram that went along with her novel. And the story of her novel was a human infant, a foundling, was abandoned in the woods and discovered, found by dwarves. They brought it back to their kingdom and raised this little infant. And as the story opens, she's now a 12-year-old girl who's taller than anyone in her kingdom. She's actually in this little square, kind of up there in the upper left-hand part, walking up a flight of stairs. And she has an identity crisis as a 12-year-old, that she's not a dwarf, she's a human, and these aren't her real parents, and she has to find her real mother to figure out who she is. So she runs away from the kingdom, and the course of the novel, which is quite a long novel written in a very derivative Tolkien-esque language, which I loved, because I thought, what a great way to learn to be a good writer is to copy a great writer. So in her best fake Tolkien writing, she writes about this girl going across the kingdom through lots of dangers, and halfway through the book she finds her mother, who turns out to be a witch. Uh, but literally a witch, not <laughs> metaphorically a witch. <laughs> and an evil witch, too, because uh, who would abandon their kid in the woods anyway, right? And she has a terrible interaction with her mother and almost gets killed, and then quite injured, psychically and, and physically, manages to get back across the kingdom for the second half of the book with lots of help from different creatures, and ends up coming back to the dwarf kingdom and deciding that it's not the worst thing in the world to be the tallest person in your kingdom, and that her foster parents really were her parents. Now, the reason I shared that whole story with you is that this girl herself was a foster child. And in, uh, in my class, she ran away from home to find her real mother. And she found her real mother in a city, and her mother was a crack addict and living on the street. And it was an absolutely terrible reunion. And she was brought home by police and decided that her foster parents in my small town were really much better than her real mother, and that this is what her life was. And as she wrote this book, it was a metaphor for her whole life. And she'd read the chapters in the morning in our morning meeting, and she'd cry, and we'd cry. And at one point, it got so personal, I just said to her, I don't think we can do this. I think it's just too personal. And she said, my therapist thought it was a really good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and the kid said, if her therapist said we should do it, we should do it. So we kept doing it. And, and I should tell you, she is now in her mid-20s, and she's doing great. And her father is one of my running partners in my running group, so I get weekly updates on how she is. And she's doing just fine. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um, we studied architecture around the world. We studied portable architecture, the cultures in the world that, where they're not permanent, where they have to carry their houses with them. We studied desert cultures and desert architecture. We studied jungle and forest architecture. Kids not only designed forest homes, but they actually went into the woods and built their forest homes, since this uh, school is in the woods. And after they built their forest homes, they gave them to the kindergartners. The kindergartners used to use these for their snacks and their naps. During the day, they'd go out from the school and they'd stay in these little homes in the woods. And one really nice thing about these homes is that they were so cute that the teenagers on their snowmobiles and ATVs never vandalized them, even though sometimes we'd find beer bottles in them from a party over the weekend. <laughs> they never hurt them in any way. So these houses lasted for three years in the woods. It's really remarkable. Um, we did a lot of architectural projects, 
This is the work of Mario Salvadori, where you give kids a certain amount of straws or toothpicks or paper, and they have to build the strongest structure or the tallest structure in a competition. We had six different architects that came in to do regular critique sessions with our students. Every Friday, we had a guest architect who would meet with students and critique their work. We brought kids to the colleges and universities that are nearby so they could learn how to draw in perspective. They got perspective drawing lessons and did a gallery of college buildings drawn by kids that later was on display at Harvard Graduate School of Education. For kids in a small town to, to go to an opening at Harvard of their work was really a powerful event for them, this idea of getting an outside audience for the work. Plus, it was another chance for them to be on a college campus talking with college kids and thinking, geez, I want to go to college. This looks great. They did uh, two-dimensional models. This is a small pizzeria. This is a clothing store. This is a small uh, ski area. And they did these by actually going to those places and interviewing store owners and meeting with building inspectors to make sure that everything was to code. This is a small uh, airport, small international airport. Scale is one, one uh, inch, three, 300 feet. Uh, there's a cute story about this one. We use outside experts for everything we did. So there's nothing we did that we didn't have experts from the community to come in and help with. These kids actually found their own outside expert, and they forgot to tell me. So they were working on this project, and I looked over in my classroom, and there was a, a guy wearing a black leather jacket with sort of messy hair and a, a bit of a, a shadow of beard on him, and he smelled pretty strongly of alcohol at 9 in the morning. And if I had been in a city school, I would have thought this guy wandered in off the street. But there's five miles of woods on any side of my school, so I know he didn't just wander in. And I was a little alarmed. So I went over, and this guy was talking to the kids working on this model. And I said, excuse me, sir, I'm Ron Berger. And he said, how you doing? And he went back to talking to the kids. <laughs> and I said, excuse me, sir, what are you doing in my classroom? And the kids looked up, and they said, he's our outside expert. What's the problem? I said, can I talk to you for a minute here? <laughs> so it turned out he was an out-of-work pilot, and I think a quite long out-of-work pilot. <laughs> um, and he was, he was the ex-boyfriend of somebody's mother, <laughs> and he was teaching the kids how to lay out their runways for their airport. And I sat down and listened, and he really was expert in this. So I got him a big cup of coffee and thanked him profusely, and, <laughs> and I said to the kids, couldn't you give me a little warning about this? And they said, you always tell us to take initiative. Now we do it and you yell at us? <laughs> like... And then, of course, all of the projects that kids make, this is a small liberal arts college created by Ben and Ryan, are shared with the community in a public exhibition of work where the kids dress up and they share with adults what is it that they learn through this project. Not just this is what we made, but what are all the academic skills and standards that we covered in the course of this. To have a public school that for 30 years used no textbooks, we better be able to justify that we're covering everything that we need to. And it's one thing to have the teachers be a spokesperson for that, but to have the kids be able to articulate and say, here are all the math standards we covered, here are all the history standards we covered, here are all the language arts standards we covered in the creation of this. It's very hard for an adult, whether they're a school committee member or a parent, to not be impressed and think, wow, this school is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Plus, the kids are doing incredibly high quality work. Um, I have some examples of this project here, and I described it a little bit in my book. This is the project where kids create a person who doesn't exist. This is Scott Chang, who's a paraplegic astrophysicist. You can see him in the foreground in his lab coat and in the background in his wheelchair. And he was created by Joey Greenspan. Joey created his portrait, but he also created his physical description, his personality description, his family description, his career description. He had to interview an astrophysicist to create his career description. He did a family tree for them. He did blueprints of his home. And I have a number of these from different characters created by students where their job is to create a really realistic person from one particular part of life and to interview somebody who has that life so that their creation is not just fantasy, but is a realistic portrait of somebody in that place in life. And we have a wide range of the kinds of characters that were created. I have this one here. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is Vinnie DiCarlo, and he worked for the Mafia. And when, 
when t that's a great <laughs> question. So the, Adam was here saying, how did they do the interview? So that's a great question because when Tate proposed this character, the kids rejected it because this was a board process. The kids, the kids read everyone's proposal and then accepted or rejected or made them tweak their proposals. They rejected uh, Vinny DiCarlo because they said, there is no way you're going to interview a mafia person. And you can't just make it up. And Tate's response was, you can interview anybody over the internet. And the kids said, I guess that's true. <laughs> so they approved it. And I have to tell you, even using the internet, Tate was not able to find a mafia person who was willing to admit they were in the mafia. <laughs> What he was able to do was attract the FBI. <laughs> so it all worked out really well for us because we ended up with an FBI agent who specialized in organized crime <laughs> coming to our classroom. And Tate had lunch with him. And I had lunch with him. And Tate interviewed him. And this guy looked just like an FBI agent. <laughs> he had a dark suit and shiny black shoes and and a black car and close cropped hair, and he didn't smile the entire interview, <laughs> even when Tate's questions were, how do you launder money? How do you fake your tax returns? How do you set up a front business? This guy just answered every question straight out. No smile, just gave the Tate took notes, Tate took notes. Um, and Tate is not a criminal now, just to let you know. He's, he an FBI agent? No, no, he, nor is he an FBI agent. If he were a criminal, I'd feel very guilty right now. <laughs> um, they created family trees, fictional family trees for these characters. Um, this is a fake birth. They artifacts from their lives. I mean, these aren't real, but it's like making their lives seem real. This, this one even had a band with uh, the liner notes and the music <laughs> and the um, <laughs> lots of. Uh, this girl was a deaf hairstylist at Split End Salon, and she got married during the year she got created. And if you want to make artifacts, I mean, a wedding, this girl did everything you'd have to do for a real wedding. She had the photographer, the caterer, the bills, the, the music lined up. She had the, the response cards. She had to create everything, even though it wasn't real. And the whole class was so excited that, you know, on the 12th of, 12th of June, like, I got up early, you know, because it's the wedding day. <laughs> And the phone rings, and it's Jenny who created it. And she didn't say, I'm sorry to call you early on a Sunday morning. She said, are you ready? <laughs> and then there was no wedding. It was like those movies where the bride doesn't show up. And <laughs> we came in on Monday, and we were all sort of crestfallen. And I, somebody said, you should have hired some people to get married. Because <laughs> we had all watched all the things get created for this wedding. And I have to tell you, I saw Jenny again when she was in college at Springfield College in Springfield, Mass. She was waitressing at a restaurant. My wife and I came in. I recognized her right away across the room and gave her a little wave, and we sat down. And after a while, she came over. And I thought she'd say, Mr. Berger, it's so great to see you. She walked over, and she said, we should have had a wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also brought some of the blueprints of these characters' homes. And these blueprints are standard architectural scale, quarter inch to a foot. Kids did a tremendous job with the care of even the fabric design and the tile design of all the work. They went through six, seven drafts. And between each draft, they were critiqued by a professional architect. So kids made sure that they were to scale and to code. So this is what they started looking like. Yeah, Cheryl. People to volunteer, like the people in the community, like you're saying all those architects and stuff. How did you get all these people to volunteer to do all this work? I went around as a teacher and met with architects. <coughs> and I brought the student work with me. And once they looked at it, they were just blown away. And I said, we're not asking you to come in and give a speech about what it is to be an architect, although you can do that for 10 minutes. We're asking you to come and run critique sessions on kids' work. And many architects said they were too busy. But the ones that came went back and told everyone else, you've got to see this class. And pretty soon, we got calls from architects saying, my friend just called me. He said, I've got to go see this class. Can I come in and be a guest critiquer for you? We had more architects than we could handle. And when we had our exhibition, the architects brought their wives and their husbands to see the work because the fact that little kids were doing this quality work was, just blew them away. So the way this structure worked is we either pinned up all the first drafts and the architect went around and pointed out features that they were impressed with or confused by, or they had one or two minutes with each kid. And they went from kid to kid giving private critique. This doesn't work. That doesn't work. That's not to code. You need to move this. You need to change that. 
And once an architect had critiqued that, it went on to a second draft, which was, actually that was a second draft. This is the third draft, which is now to scale, and then a fourth draft, and then a fifth draft. And you can see that the, these beautiful pieces didn't come from beautiful work initially. They came from lots of critique and work. And the homes tended to be pretty nice because the characters they created often had good lives. But not every one was in a fancy place. For example, one character <laughs> lived at the California <laughs> Correctional Institute at Reading. <laughs> and uh, this was a homeless character, a deaf homeless boy, no last name even. And this is a boy himself with a very hard life. And at first, when he suggested this character, the kid said, we wouldn't allow it. And they said, why? They said, you're just lazy. You don't want to do a home blueprint, so you created a homeless character. Oh. And he said, no, 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 I will do a, a home. And he did a home blueprint. And they said, well, what about a family tree? If he has no family, how are you going to do a family tree? And the family tree were all the homeless people that he hung out with. And the, home, the family tree of a homeless community had dogs and cats in it. It was really interesting. And his home blueprint is the alley where Joe lived. And you can see a, this is a plan view of the alley where Joe lived. This is a close-up of the cardboard box that Joe lived in. Here's a piece of the cardboard box that Joe lived. So it was the same kind of care, just not a fancy <coughs> house in it. We then studied city architecture and skyscrapers. Kids did their own skyscraper designs. And this is what country folk look like when we went down to New York City to see real skyscrapers. <laughs> We managed to find an architect in New York City that did skyscraper design. We brought our skyscrapers down for a critique session at the Parsons School of Design. And then we spent two days in New York City. And this is what we looked like. If you were a pickpocket, we were a group you'd want to see, I'll tell you. <laughs> and then we did a partnership with an expeditionary learning school in New York City, sharing a survey we did of city life and country life and what things cost in the city versus the country. Um, kids came back from New York. They each created a reflection <coughs> book. I brought some examples of these. I'll sh uh, they mostly critiqued the architecture of New York, but anything that hit them <laughs> was, uh, was fair game. So this is one kid's uh, piece of her journal. Yeah, the bra with the attachment was really expensive, whatever it was, I'll tell you. <laughs> so they were, they were pretty candid in their journals, I'll tell you. Um, some of the service work, and every, every expedition, uh, expedition is a word, expeditionary learning, the network I work with uses for a metaphor term for a thematic study. Every expedition had service built into it. So one service project we did in architecture was to do originally designed gingerbread houses. And uh, these were delivered during the winter holidays to families who had very little by my wife and her. My wife is a visiting nurse, and it was all of her companions that delivered these to poor families. It's not a project I'd ever do again because the kids went through 18 pounds of frosting and they ate half of it, and <laughs> three bags of candy and they ate half of it. So it was just terrible to teach during that time. But, it, um, but the families were really appreciative of these as gifts, and it was a re the kids really knew they had made a difference over the holidays to be able to give this to people. But then I told them I'd never do it again. Um, we then did the, the project that I opened my book with, actually, which is kids building a playhouse for the kindergartners, which they designed with the kindergartners. And again, it, as I said in my book, uh, as a builder, it should have taken a weekend to build it. It took us five and a half weeks because this was the first time kids had built, and they built the whole thing themselves. And I had no aid. I had no assistance in the classroom. I had 28 kids. We just went out every day when it wasn't raining. And a third of the kids were working with me, hammering. And the uh, two thirds were lying on the grass doing their other work. And then we would trade off, and a third of them would get up and come over and work with me. And the other third would go down and work on their other work. And over the course of five and a half weeks, they built this two-story playhouse with a little staircase inside of it. Um, the next project we did, we have a partnership with a, a homeless shelter in New York, the West End Intergenerational Residence, which is a homeless shelter for mothers with young children. We wrote to them and said, what would you like as a project? And they said, we love dollhouses for our little kids. 
and the girls were totally excited and the boys were really depressed. <laughs> so they together designed this crazy hybrid project which was a skyscraper dollhouse. So on the back it looked like a dollhouse, but on the front it looked like a skyscraper. And uh, so the boys could have action figures diving out the windows and they could <laughs> stage battles with them. And um, this is us down in New York City when we delivered one to the West End Intergenerational Homeless Shelter. To the, those are the little kids that live at the shelter. And I want to end these slides with uh, one particular project. This is a cross-sectional cave home design. And the reason I am attached to this project is this, the girl who created it. This is Jamie. It's her real name. And um, Jamie lived directly next to the school. So this is Jamie and her horse, Foxy. The school is behind those, those cedars right there, behind those trees. We could hear her horse all day long. It was a pain. And uh, Jamie was the most sought after babysitter in my whole town when she was a 12 year old because she was so good with kids and so good with real life and, and she was just as competent and organized and together kid as you'd ever want to have except that she was severely learning disabled. So she was on a major ed plan and in many schools would have been out of the classroom all the time. Reading and writing and math were extremely difficult for her. Luckily because this was a project based school she still had real successes. She wasn't just doing remedial work all the time. This is Jamie on the, on the left uh, when she published her first book that was going to be put in the school library. You can see how proud she is. But she came to me as a sixth grader and she said, Mr. Berger, you had my brother and I know the projects you do and I just can't do things like that because my brain doesn't work right. And I teased her and she started to cry and she said, you don't know how hard this is for me. And the second day of school we went cave exploring and she was brave and excited and everything was great. But then the third day of school she had to do that cross-sectional cave home design and this was her first draft. She was really ashamed of it and she cried. She said, I don't get it. I don't understand this figure ground. I don't understand cross section. I don't understand even how to make rooms for people to live in. It just doesn't make sense to me. And you can't make me pin this up for critique because I won't. And I said, well, you don't have to pin it up for critique, but you've got to get critique. So you've got to find somebody that you trust. And she found her friend Nicole and Nicole re-explained cross section to her better than I. And on her second draft, she starts to get this concept of cross section and above and below ground. And this one, she said, I don't mind if you pin this up for critique. And we did. And she got some critique that those overlapping rocks looked pretty cool, even though she had just borrowed that technique from her friend Nicole. She was so pleased that her third draft was all overlapping rocks. Then she got some critique that kids liked her second draft better. And she said, that's not possible. This is my latest draft. And they said, yeah, but there's not enough space in this one. So she took the space from her second draft and the overlapping rocks from her third draft, and she did a fourth draft which has more space, overlapping rocks. And then she said to me, Mr. Berger, I know you teach calligraphy because you taught my brother. Could you teach it to me really fast? <laughs> so I could have it on my final draft. And I said, you know, Jamie, I can't, but I, you're welcome to use the light table in our classroom and trace. And if you trace calligraphy for even a few days, uh, it'll change your handwriting. And so she came in early because she lived next to the school and she traced before school. After four days, this was her freelance calligraphy. And you can see freestyle even, even though it's inconsistent, it has some real ability. She really has some hand to it now. So when you look at her final draft and you see even the handwriting is pretty good on this. So the reason this piece of work matters to me, cave designs are not in my state frameworks and never will be. In some schools I would have been fired for letting this girl do six drafts of a piece of work and obsess over quality. And yet she was so proud of this piece of work that she wanted her grandparents to come in and see it at our exhibition because she did it and it was so beautiful. And I think if kids never get a chance to create something that's really beautiful that they're deeply proud of, they never have that chance to think, man, I could do so much more than people think I could. And not every kid I've worked with is a success story, but Jamie is and so I love to share it. Jamie went on to middle school at a regional middle school on a major ed plan and graduated from middle school and went on to high school and unlike her mother and her estranged father graduated from high school and went to college and she had the same learning disability she always had she just had a great work ethic for strategies I went to her college graduation party her mother unfortunately didn't live for that but uh, I, I have never been more proud of a student at her college graduation party uh, she was, she, here she was, this kid who couldn't read and write at, and she was a college graduate. She majored in horse management at the Stockbridge School of Agriculture 
at the University of Massachusetts, and she now manages a horse farm, has a five-year-old daughter, and when I run into her, I just, that's such a delight. She looks exactly like this, just bigger version of it. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, a lot of what kept her going was this sense of quality, was this sense, I can do great stuff, even though my brain doesn't work right, if with extra time and effort, I can really do great things. And now she has a college degree and she has a great job from it. So my attachment to this work is that dedication to that sense that if we have kids doing worksheets all day long, they'll never understand what quality is about. They've got to create beautiful things to understand what powerful and beautiful work really is. Yeah? What was the experience of your students prior to coming into your class? And what did they leave and go to? Because you were leaving from, in your conversation, from fifth, sixth grade to college students. Right. What, what transpired? Was this something that was so profound to them that it, it sustained itself over time? Or did they move to a like situation that built on it? Great question. So what was the context before and after? When I was at that school for 28 years, I was blessed with having kids from preschool to sixth grade immersed in this type of learning all the time. So the students I got were used to quality, used to projects. They were part of a whole school culture that valued this. They then went on to a traditional middle school and traditional high school. And luckily for me, they, had, they did better grade-wise than any feeding high school, any feeding elementary school going into that middle school and high school because they had such a good work ethic because they really tried hard. I'd love to say that everything was easy for them from then on, but it wasn't always. And, and I have to say that the, the thing that has, been, that has burned me my whole life was that their success in high school and going on to college had lots of class implications. So the students that came from very poor families often had a hard time in high school transcending that because they felt left out of the social group of the wealthier kids. And some of them didn't end up going to college because it wasn't, they weren't hanging out with the college crowd in high school. I wish I had been able to open my own high school for it. My work now is opening new high schools for low-income kids. And they're high schools where every kid has to go to college. So I've kind of shifted gears in the latter parts of my career to opening secondary schools for kids that are project-based and college-bound. But um, it was hard for a while for me to have to send them off to a traditional school. So, although they did well in terms of honor roll, because they came in with a great work ethic. Yeah? Was all of your teaching via projects, math, and, you know, and, and integration, or did you have any structured uh, teaching time? Well, the, the projects were very much structured teaching time as well. So I wouldn't differentiate between projects and structured teaching time. But much of the teaching was outside of projects, yes. Um, it was inquiry-based, but not all project-based. But even the projects themselves, to do any one of these projects, there were lots of math lessons, science lessons, literacy lessons that had to preclude any of the kids' work on this. So were there formal lessons and the regular kinds of research? Absolutely, all the time. The difference is, in most schools, those formal lessons don't go anywhere. They go to an end point, which is kids handing in something to a teacher or taking a test. The same lessons happened in this school or in the schools I work with, except that there's an audience beyond the school for them. So there's a reason to do them well. All these projects have an outside audience but outside the classroom of the kids, and that outside audience is the motivation to do a good job. Because as a teacher, you are no longer the audience for the work. You are a coach helping them to get ready for whatever that outside audience is. But it doesn't mean that you don't do regular lessons. Yeah? Can you explain a little bit about how you um, chose the projects or how the students co-chose, I'm not sure how it worked. Yeah. I, all these projects were teacher chosen because I had to plan them out ahead of time and make sure I had experts lined up and field work sites lined up and all that. But as soon as the kids got involved in them, since they were running them to some degree, they always pulled them in directions I didn't expect and they always took ownership in a way that the projects took on a whole new direction. But I had to have them planned out ahead of time so I knew they were going to meet the state frameworks and I knew they were going to teach the skills I needed them to. This wasn't a kids just come in and choose what to do. This was the kids working together on a significant piece of research that I had chosen. So we've been sitting a long time. I'm going to switch to a 10 minute video and then we'll do a break with refreshments. Um, the reason I wanted to switch to a video is that what you're hearing is me talking. And I'd much rather hear you. Uh, 
I'd much rather have you see what these kids look like and sound like talking about their projects rather than me talking about their projects. So this is their final portfolio presentations to a panel of school committee Hi. members. My name is Sophie. Last year, my class studied deaf culture. I was really, really impressed by the culture. Deaf people are different from hearing people in many different ways. They have a different sense of time, different values, different politeness, and even a different way of looking at life. My favorite part of last year's study was visiting all the deaf schools. And my favorite deaf school was the New York City School for the Deaf. I made so many good friends from that school. After we visited them, the deaf kids came and visited us. I had three deaf girls sitting at my house. No boys. This year, two other girls and I went to the Austin School for the Deaf with Mr. Berger. It's about an hour away. We went there to present our work in science. It was really, really hard, but I learned a lot. This year, I'm taking a night class in science. I really Jerome remember. was born deaf. The cause of deafness is left unknown. His problem takes place in the inner ear. The hair cells are not long enough and very rare. In Jerome's left ear, he can hear no sound in the environment. Even the loudest sounds, he only hears them in a whisper. In his right ear, it is about the same thing. Jerome is profoundly deaf. At home, Jerome uses a hearing aid, but he does not enjoy being on it, so he rarely uses it. A hearing aid do does help him some. His parents considered a cochlear implant, but after a lot of thought, decided Writing has answer. never been one of my best subjects, but there are three pieces of writing that I'm really proud of that all revolve around the same subject and are part of the same test. And this, the subject is US history, and we studied this for nine weeks, and we had nine questions to prepare for, but we only ended up taking three. And I passed all three of my essays, and I'm really proud of them because they hold a lot of information and detail without just being a list of facts. This experience really taught me how to study better. Hi, this is Noah. He plays on a basketball team called the Sonics, and here he is. Okay, the first thing I'd like to share with you that is that this is my first year in this school. I moved here from Oregon in the fall last year. and. Um, um, it's been a challenge for me fitting in and making friends, but I did. And also I came into school with some strengths and some weaknesses. Um, some of my weaknesses were I wasn't that strong in writing and also in math I was about two years behind. But in the first um, two months of school, I worked very hard and I caught up to grade level and actually I passed it. So, um, as you can see, here, I got perfect scores on my last two tests. And we also did a project where we tried to find long repeating decimals. And um, I had the longest in the class, 18 digits. And also, a mathematician sent the school um, a, a problem to work on where we used four numbers and we tried to come up with one to 100. And that was the one my group worked on. So. I contributed to that a lot. And um, some of the strengths I came in with were I'm very obsessive about detail and very meticulous, as you can see on my blueprints and some of my drawings. And also, you, you probably noticed how big my house is, and I have a lot of areas for kids to play. Well, that's because I have one sister and two brothers, so I'm a big fan. Uh, well, I'll make you stay okay with eight drafts. Mainly because it was due on that day, but <laughs> I really felt that it was completed. I, I, had, I was getting a lot of critique that day, and I had made a lot of changes. So. What's the critique like? What is it, and does well, it help you, or does it, yes, it, does helps it hurt a your lot. feelings? Ever? No. What's Mr. B's rule is uh, first say something positive and then say something like a suggestion or something not too like, oh, this is horrible, something like that. But like this could be changed or maybe you might want to do that. So, yes? Yes. Five years in different schools is totally different. This was a difficult project for me because 
I have a really hard time drawing people and getting the proportions of things right. So I had to work really hard at this, but I was really pleased when it came when it was done. And I did this on the book Dealing with Dragons on the character Princess Simaru. So now I'm going to read the character description. Take one bored princess. Make her the seventh daughter in a very proper royal family. Have her run away. Add one powerful, fascinating, dangerous dragon. Princess Simron is beautiful, but in her own way. Her six older sisters have long blonde hair and blue eyes. She has jet black hair and brown eyes. But despite the fact that girls in the kingdom are supposed to be afraid of dragons, Simron is much more interested in dragons themselves than how to scream properly if she's carried off. So when she runs away, everyone knows where she'll go. And so it's no surprise when she goes to live with Well, this year we started off our unit of water with a report on the safety and quality of the streams in the town of Shootsbury, and we tested for eight different components. We did the stream report in part to prepare us for the well report. For the well report, we tested 63 wells in Shootsbury for inorganic elements and pH. We gave each family a testing kit, which consisted of two sterile bottles, samples A and B, surveys, and an instruction sheet. Sample A is water that has been sitting near pipes all night, and sample B is water that has been flushed out. When the samples from homes all over Shootsbury were sent back, we took them to Hampshire College to be testing, tested using the inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. When we got the results back, we prepared an individual report for each family. After the individual reports were finished, our class started to pre prepare a well report for the town, which made sense. Maya and I had a lot of responsibilities to take and <clears throat> during our study, including our section, the introduction and methods, the summary of findings, labeling envelopes, <coughs> writing cover letter letters, the Bayer contest along with two other classmates, presenting to teachers, scientists, guests, reporters, and others, and much, much more. We received an award from the state for our project, which is up here. It was the Secretary's Award for Excellence in Environmental Mental um, First thing I'd like to share is my cave novel, which is called Cavern of Terror. And this is my, this is my favorite project this year. And um, it's about a group of scientists who are down studying frogs and amphibians in Central America. And um, it, the book itself is sort of a combination of political thriller and science fiction. And um, so while they're down there, they get caught up in guerrilla warfare. And, they, and uh, that's the political thriller part. And so there's all this stuff with um, the guerrillas and what they do. And uh, then when they, they go and hide out in this cave, when they escape, and uh, inside the cave, that's when the science fiction part comes in because um, there are these things in the cave, these worm things, and uh, they burrow into your flesh and they, they control you. <laughs> and um, so there's a whole episode down there where they're doing that. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to read an excerpt from the story and then they meet up. And um, her name is Camille Church. She's an architect in Mead Firm, and she lives in a small made up town called Church's Mill in Virginia. And um, now I'd like to start with a small excerpt from a home description. Imagine you were driving down a highway, the kind that gets thinner and thinner as you go further and further. Look at your map. If you are navigating correctly, then by some long turn, you have ended up in the town of Church's Mill, Virginia. Oh no, you think. This town can't have a population of more than two. The writing on the map is so small I can barely read it. You figure it can't hurt to go into town and at least make sure that they can help you. You keep driving and suddenly a town pops up in front of you, as if out of nowhere. You go on a little, and as suddenly as the town appears, the next thing I'd like to show you is my finance portfolio, and I'm sure you've heard of this. And um, this is, for our character, we've done finances, and we made up their whole life. And this is her checkbook, which we got to make up. And in it, we keep her checks and the balance of the checkbook. OK, okay. I'd also like to I just show you the tax forms that we did for her. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got to fill out tax forms for them. Um, the first one we filled out was a W-2 form, and the second was a 1040 form. And I thought it was interesting because it took a long time to try to figure it out. <laughs> she really got involved in it. And at the end of doing the taxes, she got a tax return, so I sort of felt like 
I got a tax return email. <laughs> 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 one, one strength I have is I progress a lot in drafts. Put a lot of accountants out of business. We actually use an accountant for an outside right expert. Here, and between drafts, I progress a Because I couldn't help them. So. I took things out, added things in, and my final draft is just so much more different than my first idea was. There's almost no resemblance at all. Uh, progressing between drafts is my original skyscraper design. One thing which makes me proud about this piece is that I use the critique of classmates really well. Because when we, when we had a group critique session, everybody thought that it was too busy and everything. So I took their critique, and on my final draft, I took a, I really used their critique well. And I, took, I made it a lot less busy and everything. So that really makes me proud I about that. I was how you felt or thought about studying Joan of Arc. Oh, it was, I thought it was very inspiring because all along her life she had been told that she was a nobody because she was a commoner or a peasant and basically people who were a commoner or peasant were respected and she didn't learn to read or write since she was a woman and a commoner and um, just along the way she like God told her that, well, she believes God told her that she should go <laughs> and save France and everyone was like no God talks to the Pope and then he tells it to the Cardinals and the Cardinals tell it to the bishops, bishops talk to the priests, I think. And um, she said, no, God talked directly to me. And so many people didn't believe her. They thought she was from hell, and they didn't think that what she was saying was true. And so they tried to discourage her, but she stayed strong because of her strong beliefs. And she did save France, though a lot of people tried not to save. And when she was killed, um, people who had been there at her burning thought they had killed the saint and 200 years after she died, she was named a saint. So she is not a saint, but I, sh I think her cause is good because she opened I'm going to show a segment cause. from the video that we, um, from the play that we did. Did you say? Yeah, I think this is. That was me, actually. I'm embarrassed to say. It's my era. So. Thank you. Uh, dessert is here. Thanks for being so patient for sitting so long.